next on the gridiron in September. Perfected in the magic of March. For the fans who love the crunch of the pads, prefer a dunk, and expect nothing but the best. It's Bigger Tech. Here's Steve Dace. Greetings. Welcome to this week's episode of Bigger Ten. I'm Steve Dace with my co-host, who will never be the partner, Aaron McIntyre. Good to see you again, my friend. How you be? Doing all right. Recording this on Monday, still kind of recovering from 30 hours of driving. I drove all <laughs> 2,000 miles to and wow. from South Carolina. Um, I'm I'm in a bit of a a a a a a, 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 a haze. Uh, sorry, I had to reboot <laughs> a la Joe Biden there. Uh, but no, doing all well, doing all right. I was able to listen to a little bit of college football through uh, through the mountains on Saturday night. But uh, other than that, I've just basically been looking at box scores, and it looked like it was a fairly crazy weekend in college football. It was. But before we get to the crazy weekend on the field, let's start our Big Five on Bigger Ten with the craziness going on off the field. So, so you mentioned that we are recording this on Monday, and. And I had a lot to say about the specifics of what's going on with the uh, the Michigan controversy, and now Michigan is is good has, has officially launched a counteroffensive, including counter allegations of sign stealing and signal stealing and everything else. And this is all stuff that, at the time you and I are recording this, is going to be coming out over the course of the next couple of days. Um, and the audience will be subjected to a lot of this, maybe as soon as even before this episode gets put up on the page. Okay. So you're welcome. I want to make sure you've got as much time as you want to say what you want. But but I, I, in my opinion, I think we should address the larger narrative here from a Big Ten perspective. And, and, and whether you agree or disagree with this, Aaron, I, you know, there's the classic scene in Miracle on 34th Street where the judge is facing a no-win scenario, right? If he declares that this guy, Chris Kringle, is Santa Claus, he looks like he's a loon. But if he says that there's no such thing as Santa Claus... Only all of America is going to hate his guts. And the, the guy who plays, you know, the, one of the neighbors in I Love Lucy plays kind of his conciliary in that film. And one of the strategies is just keep this thing going and wait, 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 you know, don't be in a hurry to do to make a mistake. Someone should go to Tony Petiti and say this. It is not good for this league to have our top two brands go to Talia Corleone versus Corleone on each other. No one wins. This this Pandora's box, zero sum game, it's no good to anybody. Just let the investigation happen. And if it turns out Michigan is guilty of what the other member institutions, you know, crying to you right now are claiming, hammer the hell out of them. Like take their TV money away for a year or something and disperse it to the rest of the league. Something significant. Okay. Suspend Jim Harbaugh from the Big Ten for life, okay? But to act now is prompting Michigan to do things institutionally it's never been willing to do before. I don't see how this league wins at all by the Big Ten and Michigan in a Washtenaw County court later this week over a temporary injunction against the league, imposing a largely obscure sportsmanship policy none of us even knew existed a week ago. This isn't helping anybody. Just let the process play itself out. But maybe, maybe you see it differently. What are your thoughts? Yeah, not, not really. Here's where I am with this entire saga. The main argument, is, the main argument when it gets down to the nitty-gritty of, of what, what's actually alleged here, the main argument or retort that I, I hear from Michigan players, and I agree with it, or Michigan fans, and I agree with it, is that we were... You guys are just trying to make excuses for the fact that we were better than you. And I believe that's true. I think Michigan's just been the better program the last two years, two and a half years going on three years now. But if that's true, why were we even doing this in, in the first place? And Connor Stallions has made it clear he's acted alone. It was, you know, this whole saga where he was, you know... Um, you know, coordinating and getting people to go to games, that, that was all on him. Great, well and good. Why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? There's no need to. And I've never gotten a straight answer for that. So 
if you know just that in a vacuum just that in a vacuum i really don't care what happens to michigan here however this is not taking place in a vacuum what we're seeing here as you aptly pointed out on michigan podcast earlier this week is just a psyop it's clear <laughs> it's clear as day what this is and we've seen this and it's clear because we've seen this in our day jobs over like every day that ends in y what isn't a psyop seemingly that's the question we ask ourselves most days where you'll just probe and probe and probe and look for weaknesses and you pounce, pounce on the weakness. In this case, it's uh, Tony Petiti because your school's president kind of told him to go pound rocks. So on that level, and I'm loathed to admit this, especially in front of a Michigan fan, on that level, I feel like Michigan is the victim here. And I hate saying that, but that's what's happening. If it was just in a vacuum, if this was just the sign-stealing thing, I don't give a rip what happens to Michigan. You were good enough. You didn't have to do this. And nobody's ever ever you know, explained to me why it was that they were engaging with this in the first place. Okay? Regardless of whether or not this is a multiple team or a, a sign-stealing, I don't care. You, you didn't know, need to go to the level that you went to. But then when this comes to, hmm, Ryan Day uh, asked his brother-in-law's brother, brother, brother for, you know, uh, I don't know, can you, can you investigate what's going on? This stuff, and then you get the uh, poor me act from Ryan Day's and the, the James Franklin's. You guys just got your butts kicked. And now you're looking for somebody to do the dirty work for you. And that just doesn't sit right with me. So I, I'm kind of tired of this story. Um... And as much as it loathes me, though, I, I do think Michigan is being unfairly targeted here. And I hope, and it looks like they are, I hope that they actually fight back to the degree that it's that's required to fight back against some of these uh, types of psyops. And it looks like they are. It looks like they are. I was pleasantly surprised with, oh, no, your president actually telling the Big Ten and Tony Petiti to go pound rocks. That's a good sign if you're a Michigan fan that, you you know, we're not just not going to go gently into that good night. So that's where I am on this story. And again, I, I hope this is resolved sooner than later because I'm kind of sick of hearing about it. Fair enough. Let's talk some ball. You ready? Yeah. All right. Issue two, game of the year two in the Big Ten. So let's face it, all offseason, really the entire storyline of the Big Ten centered around this round robin of these three teams. I think it's only the second time in league history that the Big Ten had three top seven teams in the preseason AP poll in, uh, in Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State. So every, and it was clear they were just power rated way ahead of everybody else. So everybody has been looking forward to this round robin. And we have been, I mean, how many of us have looked at what's the fifth tiebreaker in the league? If one team wins one, the other team wins the other, and another team wins the other one, how do we settle that, right? Well, we had the first round two weeks ago. Ohio State beat Penn State 20 to 12, pulling away late in a game where both teams struggled to block the other team. Now it's round two. Michigan goes on the road at Penn State. Uh, now this will not be a whiteout. It's the big noon game. Still, it'll be a tremendous atmosphere there, you should, you would imagine. Uh, these two teams went down to almost the, to basically the final play the last time they played in Happy Valley back in 2021. Uh, Michigan has not yet played a team ranked in the top 50 of any power rating. So this is a big step up in class for them. Ohio State, or Penn State's schedule, other than Ohio State, has not been that strong either overall because it's hard to play a strong schedule in the Big Ten this year when after these three teams, there's really not anybody else that you would think could go like nine and three, you know, and, or 10 and two or anything of that nature. So um, it, it, the situation, I think, as I said on Michigan podcast, it's a big revenge spot for Penn state. Uh, Michigan it did not play great against Purdue. Uh, I was there at least on offense. They didn't defensively. I think Purdue had five first downs until the last drive. Penn state uh, put forward, a, put forth a dominant effort against Maryland so there's a lot hinging on this game. Penn State's entire season is hinging on this game. You could say Michigan's is. You do have to wonder, given everything going against Michigan right now, if even if they lose here and were to beat Ohio State, would the committee say, well, you know, overall your, your strength of schedule is not great, so you're not getting in, right? So you kind of almost wonder now with everything going against Michigan from a PR standpoint, if they've got to run the table to get in the playoffs. So this has the feeling of pretty close to a loser leave town match, especially 
from the Penn State perspective. It is indeed. And uh, tomorrow on my picks, I'm going to go with Penn State. I just think being at home, and, and this is one of the things, I, I understand why Fox does this. You want to be the standalone game in your slot as much as possible. I hate these big games being right off the bat at noon. They should be later in the afternoon or at night. That being said, I do think they are going to have a decided, uh, obviously, a decided home field advantage uh, playing playing a, 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 in Happy Valley. That's a big deal, or at least should be a big deal. But... When it comes to Penn State, I, I thought the way they matched up with Ohio State of these two big games that each of these three teams play in the East, I thought that was the matchup that I thought Penn State, you know what, they, they could win that. This is not a good matchup with, with Michigan. It's not. Michigan's just trying to do what you do, and they do it a lot better, and they've shown that they've done it a lot better. The question that I have, and this is what I'm banking on, is that y'all just utterly demolished them last year. There are a lot of players on that roster that lived through that. Now you've got them back in your own crib, and you want to show them, hey, we're not the same guys that we were last year. In the NFL, making a handicap like that, is that a good idea? Not really. You know, to some degree, revenge, you know, you can put factor that into your handicap. When you're talking about 18 to 22 or 23-year-olds, That can be a big deal. So that's what I'm banking on. Not super confident. I'm not really sure what the keys to victory are for Penn State, other than just the basic crap you hear every single uh, breakdown of a game. No big mistakes. Don't turn the ball over and just try to play solid defense. That's, That's what I would say. Don't give Michigan anything easy whatsoever. And uh, you might have a chance, but I, I don't know. What's your? I, I heard you break this down yesterday. But if you were from from the Michigan perspective, if you were from, coming from a Penn State perspective, where would you say are the maybe two or three keys for Penn State to really accentuate to give themselves a chance? I think the the thing I'm the thing I'm 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 glad to see if I'm Penn State is my weakness is holding up at the point of the attack and the internal gaps, and that's where Michigan just destroyed us a year ago. Michigan does not have that kind of running game this year. Um, and I and Michigan has not really shown... I mean, let me quantify this for people. Donovan Edwards' longest run so far this year, Aaron, is 14 yards. All right? Blake Corum has had one rush over 40 yards. He has had one 100-yard game. Now, some of that should be noted is Michigan has, has coached all season given the schedule with an intent of trying to make Blake Corum as absolutely fresh for these last few games as possible. When last year, while JJ was developing, they had to run him into the ground. Okay. And, and so, I mean, the amount of carries that Blake Corum has gotten in the second half of games this year is next to nothing, particularly in the fourth quarter. So that is some of it, but that doesn't explain the Donovan Edwards numbers at all. Michigan is still averaging about 4.6 yards per carry, which is in the t- top, few, uh, I think, handful in the Big Ten. But, but Aaron, that's a full yard behind what Michigan averaged a year ago. So if I'm Penn State, I have to understand that Michigan probably won't be able to just run the ball downhill against me without incorporating J.J. into the running game. And, and, and I can account for that, too. What I can't account for is if Michigan suddenly decides to do something it has not willi- really been willing to do quite often under Jim Harbaugh, and certainly not even with J.J. McCarthy at quarterback. And that is if Michigan goes to more of an RPO scheme, a run-pass option scheme. Because then, I, then you've got a situation where J.J. is now not just in, being incorporated into the running game to get downhill, but now he can. if you're crashing on the run, he can just throw to receivers behind that crash and exploit that. But that is not an offense that Michigan has run very often this year. So call me can, call me dubious that they're just going to suddenly pull this out in Happy Valley at that erector set in front of 105,000 people and run an RPO system uh, effectively that they've barely run all year long. Maybe they will. I'd love to see that, by the way. But um, I'm not sure that we will. For Penn State, my biggest worry is the same thing that against Ohio State. Michigan's defensive front is better than Ohio State's. Um, and, and in terms of it actually just has more depth. It does, it does, the, the top four or five guys for Ohio State and Michigan are basically even. But Michigan can roll hockey lines there. I would worry about being able to block Michigan. And I think Michigan should be worried about being able to block Penn State. I, I, like I said, a Michigan podcast, I, I think 24 could very well win this game. Yeah, no, that makes sense, and I think it just comes down to motivation and focus for Penn State. That's that's the name of the game, and um, 
I, I was just I, I, there was a huge blow to my confidence in this program after that Ohio State game. I expected a lot more from them, and now you've got an even worse matchup. But it's at home, and it's, it's against a team that embarrassed you last year. So I, it's not it's not quite a coin flip in my mind. But uh, that's why they play the games, as they say. And I, 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 if you're James Franklin, at some point you just got to get off the schneid, don't you? Now you might not do that against Michigan, but at some point you've got to come through in one of these games. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not entirely confident. I will, I will pick them tomorrow in our in our picks segment. But um, man, alive! Uh, when we talk about expectations for this Penn State team coming into the season, we thought, hey, they're going to be right in this with Ohio State and and Michigan. And now we're like trying to grasp at straws a little bit for how they can win a game or at least stay close. Uh, that says a lot. Let's talk the West really quick. I, I guess you could say Iowa has taken back control of the division as much as anybody can have control of that division in its current state. But Hawkeyes got a, a three-run homer from uh, Drew Stevens. Um, 53 yarder. So, I mean, what's the home run equivalent there? Like a 450 foot shot there? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, and that uh, that was actually the third highest scoring game at Wrigley Field this year, I was told. Yep. So, um, but they got the job done against Northwestern, who might want to reconsider playing these games at Wrigley. They haven't won one of them yet, by the way. So, Iowa is back in front, controls its own destiny. Both Minnesota and Wisconsin lost as well in separate games. So, there you go. I mean, Deacon Hill had 65 yards passing. But like 28 of them happened in the final drive hey, to get hey, Iowa hey, in hey. field goal percentage. So give him credit for that. Yeah, I, I think people are a little too hard on Deacon Hill after this uh, after this uh, performance. He had a completion percentage of 66 percent, Steve. Two out of three. Yeah. Ten out of 15. Okay. For 60 some yards, was it? Okay. So, so you got to look at the bright spot somewhere. They they might not win another game. They might win all of them. I don't know. I got back on Sunday evening from this 2,000-mile round-trip whirlwind journey. We're rushing to get to South Carolina. We're rushing to get back. You know, I've seen a lot of really stupid drivers in that 2,000 miles. I plopped downstairs. I got some Casey's gluten-free pizza. This is Sunday evening. Plop downstairs. I'm just freaking exhausted, man. Just exhausted. And I'm like, well, haven't watched the Iowa game yet, so I, I turn on the replay. <laughs> Do I need counseling? I, I did that when I'm exhausted and, like, just need to sleep, but I just decided, hey, let's turn on a 10-7 Iowa game. I knew what the score was. I think I might need some counseling. All right, Aaron, if you don't mind, let's completely switch gears. All right. College basketball begins this week. And by the time we do another episode of Bigger Ten, the following matchups within our league would have already taken place. So Texas A&M ranked in the preseason AP poll at Ohio State, trying to bounce back after a disappointing year. Dayton and Northwestern, a couple of NCAA tournament teams. Tennessee and Wisconsin, a couple of NCAA tournament teams. Tennessee preseason top 10. Michigan at St. John's with uh, Rick Patino. That's part of the Gavit games, as is Xavier at Purdue. Wisconsin at Providence is as well, although there's a new coaching staff there. Michigan State and Duke at the United Center in Chicago. Uh, that's, of course, a, a big-time matchup. Marquette at Illinois. Marquette, a preseason top-10 team against Illinois, who beat Kansas, number one Kansas, in that exhibition a week ago. And then your Iowa Hawkeyes uh, in, in a series that probably ought to, frankly, be played every single year. All right? At least as long as Greg McDermott is at Creighton. Iowa is at Creighton, which got what to the Elite Eight last year, I believe. Yep. All right. So those matchups will already have been played in this league by the time you and I do another episode of Bigger Ten. And props to Wisconsin, man. They're not messing around with the start to their season. So what stands out to you there in those matchups? I, I want to see what Michigan has this year. They were kind. They kind of surprised me in uh, last week when we were talking about the uh, Ken Palm ratings. They kind of surprised me how high they were. Um, so I, I want to see what they have. I know that you've been a little down I'm on their down. prospects way on down. Michigan. Yeah. So I want to see what they have. Also, Wisconsin. Like, see a Wednesday night at the Big Ten tournament down. 
that yeah. down, that far down. Yeah. Tennessee at Wisconsin is another one. I want to see what Wisconsin has. I mean, they're picked to fit, uh, finish in the top half of the the Big Ten or close to the top of the Big Ten this year. So I want to see what they have. They're bringing literally everybody back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, what else? Michigan State, Duke couldn't go wrong there. I, I'm not sure what Duke is is uh, expect what their expectations are this year. And then of course um, Iowa at Creighton. I, I'm you know as low as you are on Michigan. I'm even lower on Iowa. I, I don't know where they go for scoring this year. Somebody's going to some buddies are going to have to st- to to start uh, standing up for Iowa. Uh, at some point this season so Iowa at Creighton I just want to see what they what they do when they have a big test because I think that'll be maybe a harbinger of things to come for this Iowa squad because unlike the last three or four maybe even five seasons there's not a guy you point to on Iowa's squad who you say hey that's going to be their go-to guy mm-hmm. there's not just not a single guy on their squad that you can say that about so those are kind of the three or four that I'm I'm looking forward to all right final thing speaking of basketball the Big Ten lost one of its absolute all-time legends with the death of Bob Knight uh, in the last week, 83 years old after a prolonged battle against Alzheimer's. Now, of course, Knight was not without controversy, uh, the ignominious end of his reign at Indiana uh, after uh, the uh, abuse of uh, one of his players. But when you look at the long arc of his life and career, we're talking about a guy that won three national championships and and those three teams, I believe, included only one player that was an NBA first-round draft pick, Isaiah Thomas. Um, he knew how to craft teams, uh, knew how to coach young men, um, larger-than-life figure, both on and off the court. He is really one of the greatest, what, top three, top five? You're talking, you yeah. know, Amos Alonzo, Stag, you know, that level of legend in our league, Aaron. And... uh and and it's hard not to recognize him at his passing. Even his career was pretty much on the downside as you were coming of age. But still, I mean, we're talking about one of the greats in the history of our conference. Yeah, I, I'm too young to remember his time at Indiana, but I do remember watching him at Texas Tech. Yeah. And keep in mind, I was, I would have been 10, 11, 12 years old, maybe even 9, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old when he was still coaching at Texas Tech. And I was a homeschooled, slightly sheltered, pretty sheltered young kid. And I remember thinking, this guy frightens me. <laughs> Through the television screen, he was fright. I mean, he is, he was full of, let's just say, fire uh, and piss and vinegar uh, for his entire coaching career. And it was, it was kind of sad when he was doing color commentary, I think, for ESPN towards the last uh, latter part of his days. Mm-hmm. It was him and Brett Musburger. Yeah, yeah, it was sad, though, to see the guy even at Texas Tech that I'd seen just so full of enthusiasm and fire at Texas Tech, just see him kind of slowly deteriorate and and he is a legend, and rightfully so. And uh, he'll 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 be missed. He's still a legend in in Indiana. And I, I remember there was a time where he was I can't remember which host it was. It was on ESPN. Asked him if he ever wanted to go back to Indiana, and he said he wanted to have nothing to do with that. Well, I'm glad that he did eventually, and and go back and get recognized, and uh, def, de, de, like I said, deservedly a, a legend. And he'll be missed. When my time on Earth is over. And or no, when my days are over, my time on earth is past. What is he? What is he said? Something like that. I, you know, my message to my contractors is you can kiss my ass or something <laughs> along those lines. That's just classic Bobby Knight. I know I butchered that, but you get the sentiment. Yeah. All right. We'll come back and play. Would you rather here in a moment? All right, Aaron, let's play. Would you rather? First one is for you. Would you rather bet Penn State money line over Michigan or Penn State plus 1,800 to win the Big Ten? Because if Penn State wins on Saturday, those odds are going down a lot lower than 1,800 to win the Big Ten, right? Although they still don't control your own destiny because you're still counting on Michigan beating Ohio State later on. So what do you think? So let's do this real quick, shall we? I'm going to do this. I was thinking about this because I saw this before. And this is this is actually because what you're really betting on here, if that 18 to 1 odds, you're really betting on two games. You're betting on this one 
and then you're betting on Ohio State beating Michigan at the end mm-hmm. of the, the year, correct? So let's do a quick let's do a quick exercise here. On the money line, Penn State is at plus 170. I imagine that'll be the same type of money money line that Ohio State will be against Michigan. Plus 170, plus 200. Let's find another plus 200. Okay, Indiana at Illinois. If I parlay, parlay those together, that's 7 to 1 odds. So 18 to 1 odds. Am I wrong in thinking that's bad value? So you're betting on two games. Yes. But if you took them separately or just parlayed them together, 18 to 1 is a lot better than us. Uh, what? Plus 200 right now or plus 170, whatever it is. No, that's so, smart. That's I don't smart know. handicapping on your it's part. Not, I think it's a, a, a little bit of a value bet. I would rather, you know, generally speaking, just go to one game if you're waiting on multiple variables, variables to happen. But. I don't know. I'd take a. Fl- I don't think either will happen, but I would rather take a flyer if it was just a five dollar free bet. Take a flyer on eighteen to one at this point. But again, you're relying on uh, Ohio State to pull the upset at the end of the year. Would you rather take Michigan State money line against Ohio State this weekend or Iowa Rutgers over twenty nine points? Oh, I don't want any. Mich- Ohio State has just destroyed Michigan State like the last five six times in a row. And it, with an over 29, Gavin Wimsat can throw a pick six or, or two. I think Deacon Hill can throw a pick six or two. I mean, I, I could, remember this happened with these two teams last year. And didn't Iowa have two pick sixes and the game went over, right? Oh, yeah. So I, I, I could see each team getting a pick six in this game uh, and scoring on defense. So I think I'd, I'd much rather take the over 28 in Iowa Rutgers. What a total that is, though, man. That's nuts. Started at, I think, 20, 28 and a half. Yeah, it's, it opened at 28 and a half. All right, for you, would you rather bet Purdue or the field to win the Big Ten basketball title? I'm already on record saying I think Purdue is going to do what Virginia did, lose as a, as a one to a 16 in 2018, and then come back in 2019 with everybody and win it all. I think Purdue's going to do that this year. I'm very high on Purdue. But would you rather bet Purdue or the field to win the Big Ten basketball title? Purdue, I, I think everybody else is just going to beat them up, beat themselves up. So it, are they going to drop a game or two? Yeah, that's entirely possible. But that's a lot different. Two or three games, two to four games, something like that. That's a lot different than dropping, you know, six to nine, which is probably what the majority of the field is going to do. So give me Purdue. Finally, for you, would you rather be Ryan Day's brother or Connor Stallion's lawyer? <laughs> Gosh. Is that the greatest would you rather in the history of this segment? That, that's pretty. It's got to be up there. I think I'd rather be Connor Stallion's lawyer because yeah, dude too. hasn't done anything illegal. We're not entirely sure the other side can say that, if you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Okay? So even if you think Connor, Connor Stallion's did everything possible, it's not against any law. Um, getting access, though, to his hard drive without his consent, um, that would be against the law. Okay, so I'd much rather be representing a client who didn't break any laws. But I love this question. Very, very well done. All right, we'll come back and wrap things up here in a moment. All right, this week's Twitter poll question we asked, who wins? 73% Michigan, 27% Penn State. I think Penn State's got better odds than 27% to win the game. You know, but what do you think, Aaron? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I I would put them you know the floor at like 30 to 35 percent something like that now keep in mind this is going to be michigan's first now i i understand that they went to lincoln but it's nebraska first year head coach yeah atmosphere i'm sure was good but um it wasn't 100 percent uh nebraska fans michigan goes everywhere as they will this weekend as well this is really going to be their first hostile atmosphere against a quality opponent or at least we think there's still a quality opponent so i'd put the floor at like 30 or 35 percent chances that penn state uh, will win this game but uh i'm i'm hedging as much as i possibly can i just have to think that the motivation edge the motivational edge has to be with penn state after what happened last year all right This week's feedback of the week in response to me asking on our Twitter account, is literally anybody going to win the West? Based AF Spectator writes, apparently it will be the team that struggles to hit double digits, fired their OC midseason, so they just play defense and special teams. I mean, if we were just ranking defense and special teams, I was a top 10 team in the country. Throwing in the offense, though, well... 
the defense and special teams are still among the top 10 in the country for sure. All right, that's our feedback of the week, and that's this week's episode. Like, rate, subscribe, follow, share, whether you're watching on YouTube or uh, listening on iTunes. Help us to find more Big Ten fans just like you. All right? And thank you to all of you that have done those things for us as well. We appreciate them. Uh, We'd also appreciate it if you followed us on Twitter in between episodes at Bigger Ten on Twitter. Until the next time, for Aaron McIntyre, I'm Steve Dace. We'll see you next week right here on Bigger Ten.